on this Monday lunchtime. And it's really delightful to welcome back Adam Wooten from Impact Sales Coaching. Hi, Adam. How are you? Hey, Steve. Hi, gang. Yeah, good afternoon. I'm very well, thank you. I must say, it's nice to see everybody again. Nice to see you, Steve. It is. It's been it's been a few weeks, well, a few months maybe since you were last with us on Lunch and Learn, Adam, but it's, uh, it's always good to welcome a great guest speaker back to, to join us, to hear about uh, how we can use your skills uh, to help us and your, your insight into the sales process we're going to be talking about this Lunch and Learn uh, into her, in terms of how we can increase business and get ourselves in the best possible place as the restrictions start to ease. Uh, just before we go into that, Adam, I'm going to in, you know, let you introduce yourself, yourself more formally in a minute a bit in terms of what you do at Impact. But if you are listening to us for the first time, please do ask any questions on either LinkedIn, Zoom or Facebook. And Adam and myself, my colleague Pam is in the background, we'll do our best to answer those questions. It'd be good to hear from you. Um, and if you're listening to us on the YouTube channel later on, please do connect with us on LinkedIn, on Facebook. Um, we'd love to, to have that conversation uh, with you. And if you're back for more, if you've heard us before and you're back again, please do you know share, give us a like and uh, add any other comments as well. But Adam, it's great to have you with us from Impact Sales Coaching. It is what it says in the tin, I guess, in terms of what you do. But do you just want to introduce yourself more formally to us? Tell us a bit about um, it, what you do at Impact. I will do. Thank you, Stephen. Absolutely. Like the Ron Searle advert it is what it says on the tin. I suppose what really matters is how I go about that. So uh, work with SMEs as well as large corporates, but work with sales teams and business owners to, to really help their business thrive from a business development, from a sales perspective. Uh, so if customers are using and should have great digital marketing, great website, good presence, consistency, but if you're not seeing the conversion that reflects that investment, there could be something around consultative questioning, closing, objections, negotiating. Those are things that I'll, I'll help people with. And then the other half of my business uh, is around running the level four sales executive apprenticeship. So we're regulated by Ofsted and the Association of Professional Sales, where companies use their levy money to uh, send their, their sales executives on, on an 18 month sales intensive program. So yeah, that's me. Well, it's great to have you, you with us, Adam. And um, I have to say, you know, we were just saying before we went live that of all the Lunch and Learn guests that come on this show, um, you're the only one that makes me run up. You may not actually make me, but I run up to my bedroom making sure I've got a shirt and tie on that I'm, I'm fit for purpose and, uh, you know, in the game to make sure I'm pitching myself in the right way to you, Adam. So, uh, no, it's, uh, I, I, I joke, but it's, uh, it's good to have you back with us. And uh, you have, uh, for the first time in 12 months, uh, made me put a tie on, which it feels good. feels good. Um, so I guess, you know, starting point is just thinking about, you know, the, the last 12 months for all of us. You know, we, we, we've been into a challenging time and you and I have seen and presented to this slide many times, Adam, in the Lunch and Learns and other workshops we've done together. And I really feel that whatever industry our listeners might be in, you know, we're all in this warming up phase now where we absolutely need to be thinking, you know, regardless of whether we've been trading throughout lockdown or not, you know, the world is about to change. The, the way in which we do business is changing all the time. But as, as the restrictions ease, there's a massive opportunity for every single one of us, isn't there? And we were just saying before we came on, on live, actually, how many of my clients are, are seeing a real upturn in the business over the last couple of weeks. Have you, have you seen the same, Adam? What, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, absolutely have. People looking to fly out of the gates. They've been using, hopefully, certainly my clients have been using their time wisely, working out what their real value propositionings are, knowing their routes to market. And the and that's starting to pay off now. Inbound leads are coming in and it's just how quickly we, we respond to those really. So, yeah, things are, I love the fact that you've called it, you know, phase three is warming up. That is exactly what's happening now. Uh, and it's a really exciting time that we all must capitalize on, really. So, yes, these are good times. It's like, it's like any, any great athlete preparing for that sprint, isn't it? You know, we've got to make sure we've got that real clarity, that real focus in our minds so that when we're running that race, we can, as it says on the screen, actually lead from the front, you know, make sure we're not left behind when the firing pistol goes. Uh, and I say there may well be many industries, many business owners listening to us right now who have continued trading. But I think, you know, things are changing and are beginning to change. As, as dare I say, confidence, would you say, Adam, is, is starting to we turn back and people are feeling a bit more confident either consumers or businesses about starting to invest in themselves, in the business and in their clients. Yeah, absolutely. And it's not something that changes overnight. Um, business models may have shifted and changed and pivoted being the word that gets thrown around a lot, but it's still meaningful pivoted during lockdown. And now we're looking at a world of, well, blimey you know things things starting to warm up and i suppose the, getting the confidence to get back into the swing of things uh, could take a little time that's why we look at marginal gains from a performance mindset 
perspective. Um, so yeah, these are good times for everybody. Um, but yeah, making that mental mindset switch, it is go time now. Uh, I've been talking to my guys about that because if you're not coming out of the blocks and you're not stretching and getting ready now and, and doing what you can do, perhaps through FOMO, fear of missing out, you could be certain that your competitors and your other clients are getting ready, war paint on and looking to get out there. So you, we need to get out and add value and help as many people as possible. Uh, so yeah, now is a pivotal time. And, and as a part of Action Coach here in Birmingham, what we love more than anything else in any business is a great system. And uh, a BFO for me, uh, Adam, a blinding flash of the obvious when I first joined Action Coach, you know, I thought, oh, great, I'm going to be coming in coaching and work with clients to build their business. But actually, as every, every SME out there will, owner will know, we're all in the game of sales and marketing, aren't we? Without sales and marketing, we don't have a business at all. Uh, and for sales and marketing to work, we've got to have a great system behind it and make sure we've got that methodical approach to every single opportunity. And, and that's where, where you know, the likes of yourself and your training come in, isn't it, Adam, in terms of you know, the tips and the skills that you work with business owners on, on developing? Yeah, I think you've hit on a, a, a really good, important point there. Um, and it's actually about, yes, it's sales and marketing, but everybody in the business is in sales and marketing. Whatever touch point you have in your business from somebody in accounts, maybe you're doing the accounts and everything yourself, but whoever, whatever touch point that is through marketing, accounts, operations, delivery, whatever it is, you are representing those, you know, these people are representing your business. And so you are selling in some way. Um, so we are all salespeople in business. And I think sometimes we need to realize that a little bit. And some people tend to carry at times the self-living to belief of, oh, but I don't do sales. I'm, I'm not in sales because of this, mm -hmm. it's a murky world or whatever it may perceive to be. It really isn't. And it really doesn't need to be. Uh, it's about being inquisitive and adding value to people. The rest of us, the rest of it will take care of itself to some extent. It's interesting when I do um, what, what we call an alignment here at Action Coach with, with our clients. We meet them for the first time and say, you know, building that relationship. And I often ask them the question, what do you think when I say salesperson? And the answers <laughs> that, that come forward of all sorts, you know, everything you can imagine, you know, car sales, estate agents. But nobody actually uses the word myself. Um, you know, they don't see themselves as that salesperson on behalf of the organization. It's something that people see as other people doing rather than themselves. Yeah. But in terms of. Sorry. Go on. No, no, go on, Adam. Go on. No, I was going to say, we always end up doing this, Steve. <laughs> I love it. Um, <laughs> what I was going to say is, there's, uh, there's, I don't know where it came from. I'm not that well educated, I suppose. But somebody, there was a phrase saying, you know, if you build it, they will come. Um, this is 2021. That's not the case. So, you know, we do need to be selling and representing and, and putting our brand out there. So, yes, I, I would absolutely agree with that. And, it, it you know, sales, I, I say sales and marketing, but it's all you know, surrounded, encompassed by great communication. That's what sales is in many, in many ways. Um, Adam, in, in terms of the perfect pitch, do you just want to talk us through from your perspective, you know, in terms of for any any business owner uh, or somebody in sales on behalf of the business, what some, some quick tips and hints and, and bits of advice that we could give them this lunch and learn they could take away as they're thinking about reopening or reinventing the way they do, you know, they sell their business. Or maybe they've had a complete change during lockdown in terms of what they do and how they do it. And, and how do we convey that in the sales process? Wow. Lot to unpack there. Like it. Yeah, absolutely. No you know me, I, I like to throw I like to throw a loaded question at you, Adam, and let you catch it and uh, <laughs> show, show what you're going to do with it. That's awesome. So, right. If you look at presenting because ultimately that's what we should all uh, we all are doing so um what i might do if if the technology will allow me is i'll just share a few slides and and we'll power through these together if that's okay with you uh, of course no problem at all let me stop sharing adam and you can uh, you can fire your system up fine no problem right screen two bang share we'll get this going um so uh, there are a, a few bits and pieces and I'll, I'll kind of not blast but i'll go through this relatively at pace and you know, guys who are observing and watching at the moment, any questions, just send them over um, and we can, we can deal with them together. So first Actually, of all... Pause there, Adam. Pause there. I have my first question from James. Let's He's go, just saying, James. What, what is the difference between pitching and presenting? There we go, James. Right in there at the very beginning. Like it. Difference between pitching and presenting. We could split hairs. Arguably, they are slightly different. So this is a presentation. I'm not here to sell to you today. I'm presenting, I'm imparting knowledge. Whereas pitching by definition is then of course, looking to get something out of it, ready to close, something like that. So you're pitching for funding, pitching to sign a new customer, a contract extension. They are very subtle differences. 
Um, so this is a presentation. Pitching is in its true sales context. Um, be careful using the word pitching, though, especially if we can use the word pitching to prospects uh, or to existing customers, because quite frankly, some people can find that a little bit salesy. And I respect that. So be careful in the definition, the wording you use. But th those are the differences between pitching and presenting. I have to say, you know, I do I agree with you on what you're saying with the word pitching. There are some people who see that and sort of back off a bit, don't they? As if they're going to be yeah. sold to or, or sort of, you know, pressure is going to be applied with with, with terms of pitch. Um, so it's just judging the situation and the client in front of you, isn't it, or the person in front of you? It really is. Uh, and Steve, something I know you've covered before uh, is around uh, social preferences, otherwise known as uh, character traits, personal profiling, those kind of mm -hmm. things in terms of you know, the DISC model or drivers analytical. It's actually adapting mm -hmm. our style to that to meet the needs of the person that we're presenting to. And that also includes, of course, the words and phraseology that, that we use. And so what I would suggest, and I'll go through some of these points relatively quickly, but first of all, it, it, it's an internal job first when we think about presenting or pitching in terms of convincing and selling ourselves first. Without being able to convince and sell ourselves and our solution and our ability, we couldn't begin to influence or persuade anybody else. So when we think about pitching or presenting right out of the gate, it's a fantastic opportunity for you to demonstrate that you've understand and understood what the potential needs are of your customers and then get to what those pain points and articulately put across the features, advantages and benefits of what you offer equally to then build rapport, demonstrate your area of expertise. But it's how you approach that is uh, absolutely fundamental. And yes, it takes practice. But one of the points I put on there uh, this is a phrase. Uh, sorry, control, uh, sorry, control your mindset links into control the controllables, which is a phrase that I took from Hal Elrod's Miracle Morning book. But it is a mindset job and it's an internal job when we're looking to go into present. So when you're in the lift going into your presentation or you're going in to get funding on something, we can at times feel quite nervous. It's a perfect human emotion. And it's certainly something I still get occasionally. I've got a negotiation tomorrow morning. It's a really important negotiation. But instead, let's change that phraseology from nervous to perhaps excited. And um, Ant Middleton wrote a book. He's done a few books, uh, like the bloke or not, that doesn't matter. But he got a book called The Fear Bubble or something like that. I read, I read that in the day. That's really good about how to control fear. Um, but control your mindset. And there's things that you can do to um, control those things. So there's a great phrase you remind both. me of, Adam, as we just as you started, you know, we all talk about treating others as they wish to be as you wish to be treated yourself. And actually, I think in sales, it's treat others as they wish to be treated or speak to others as they wish to be spoken to, because it's all about getting the right language, isn't it? You need to understand their language and speak their language when when talking, you know, when, when selling or pitching, whichever phrase we want to use. And the other, I, I think it's a really valuable point about mindset, Adam. You know, I talk to my clients. I use the phrase IVVM, which is idealize, visualize, verbalize and materialize. But it, it is about, you know, we can teach you, we can we can give you in this lunch and learn all the tricks in the book. But if you don't believe in it yourself, if you don't believe you can close the sale, where are you going to end up? You know, it's, you've got to have the right mindset, absolutely the right mindset to do it. Totally. And I don't want to be that guy that keeps quoting stuff out of books. So I won't. This time I'll use a film. <laughs> um, one of my favourite <laughs> films is uh, In Pursuit of Happiness, an amazing film. And Will Smith coins a quote from somewhere else that says, you know, the, the person who says he can and can't, they're both right. You can talk yourself in and out of, of absolutely anything. So, yes, it is very much um, a, a mindset piece. And to support you with that, again, sales resilience and resilience just in general is the ability to bounce back. And touching on something else that you said there, Steve, around customer expectations, Forbes did a study, and uh, it's obviously quite a big old study, and asked people, you know, if you're going to go into, let's say, the Apple store, or name any other store in terms of customer service, what would you expect to see? And some of those examples that came across is someone that values my time, has my best interest at heart, is genuinely willing to listen and offer me a solution that I actually need. So sometimes we see that in sales where we have hungry business owners or sales teams that have got KPIs or, you know, in terms of how many dials and they've got their target set in terms of revenue and margin to the point where they almost forget about the customer journey. They're so focused on, gosh, you know, I'm 5, 10, 15, whatever grand behind this month, this quarter, and we can push that pressure onto the prospect. That's your problem, not theirs. And it's having that ability to split those two things. Absolutely, so yeah. Love it. To, start, 
to start with, it, it's um, I'm not here to patronise. Everyone will do what they need to do, but again, controlling the controllables, these are the things that are easily overlooked when we think about the housekeeping elements. Make sure your kit's in order, laptops, make sure your camera's set up, dial in early. Um, you know, it's a very Zoom type of thing. Uh, as funny as it is to have a cat running across your laptop, that was funny about a year or more ago. Um, I don't want to be that guy that's too brutal, but we've all seen these things and I know you can't I, help it. I was looking down then, I was looking down there to check where the dog was, as you were saying. <laughs> where's, the, where's the dog? <laughs> <laughs> so true. And, and printouts. So, you know, for this, I've still got my slide deck printed out. Because if something happens, I can still carry on. And these are things that we probably all know. But because we know it, sometimes maybe we'll cut corners if we're not too careful. Um, mixing yeah, I mean, the num num number Sorry. of meetings I've been in where somebody's actually just very simple thing. You've walked from one room to another. You forgot to plug your laptop in. Then you're in the middle of the most crucial bit of the meeting and somebody's laptop dies. You know, and that, I've seen that more obviously over the last 12 months using you know, Zoom and other platforms as well. It's, it is just basic you know, basic housekeeping that we need to make sure we've we've got in place. Yes, absolutely right. And then when we talk, think about when we think about the housekeeping side of things, when you're allowed to meet your customers, you know, when we can actually get out and meet them, what's the right format? Not everybody wants to sit in front of a PowerPoint presentation. I don't want to always sit in front of a PowerPoint presentation. So how can you mix things up? So taking extra handouts, maybe you take presentation boards. Um, I was in a, a post-sales stage, but it was a, mo a mobilization of, of, of a uh, key account. And we just got loads of flip chart paper across the whole boardroom. It mix these things up a little bit. It doesn't always have to be PowerPoint presentations with a boatload of text or whatever else on. But if we do go down that route, such as this, because this is the best medium really for this setting, make it visual. Um, most vast majority of people are indeed visual learners. Um, and if you're not sure what type of learner you are in terms of information preferences, it's worth having a look at that. Um, I know, Steve, this some, I feel like this is something you're going to know a lot about in terms of... We, we, yes, we, well, I'm, I'm by no means an expert. We have done Lunch and Learns and we'll have to do another one in the future all about visual, audio and kinesthetic learning. Uh, and we do it alongside, you and I have done it alongside um, disc personality profiling. It is, it is trying to pick up on those cues and those, you know, understand you know, your prospect, how they might best absorb the information you've got to share. And you'll pick that up through those touch points that we talked about earlier on, Adam, in terms of that lead up, won't we, to the actual sales meeting itself. But a question from Sarah, Adam, I don't know if you you might be covering this on the next slide, but I don't want to jump ahead. But um, as we start to see restrictions eased, she's saying this: there's this dilemma about working virtually versus starting to meet face to face and understanding when is the right time to introduce that? Yeah, great question. And, you know, no one's got a crystal ball, right? But what I can do is share what I've been doing and how things are going. So I won't drive that, essentially, that decision. I'll let the client drive it. Uh, how would you like us to meet? Now, if we think from a business perspective, we could rack up the Zoom meetings. That means we're going to be super productive. But, of course, whilst that's an advantage, the disadvantage to that is, of course, the actual physical contact of the shaking hand, the meeting, looking out for some of those verbal nods and cues in terms of buying signals where people ask more questions, lean forward and all those sorts of things. So to answer your question, Sarah, I think it should be blended. You should be comfortable in delivering both in terms of face-to-face -face and virtual. You may have a preference, actually, you're a bit zoomed out and you'd rather meet face-to-face. -face. Um, I can relate to that, but let the customer drive that. Offer them, offer them that opportunity. And as long as you reference you know, safe systems of work, however they feel comfortable, um, then I think you'll be all right. But that's how I, that's what I've been doing. And I, I've got meetings, physical meetings booked in the diary for a few months time. Uh, and I think in reality as well, when we're maintaining contracts, we don't always want to have to go visiting all of our contracts all of the time. I think that virtual meetings are going to be something that's here to stay. And I think it's a really useful, productive tool I used to be doing three and a half to 4,000 miles, business miles a month, driving all over the place. Well, now it'll be blended between virtual and face-to-face. -face. Maybe the quarterly review meetings could be face-to-face, -face, but the monthly check-ins could be on virtual. This is a great new tool. Not, I wouldn't say it's a new tool anymore, but this is a great tool for us to use. So let the client drive it, but be open-minded to blended. Don't always rely on face-to-face -face if that's your preferred style. Uh, that's how I would address that point. Absolutely. I couldn't 
agree with you more. I, you know, I think it is there is that blended or hybrid approach as I've I've been talking about. I think the, the only thing I'd add is, you know, what it, if you are meeting face to face, you know, obviously don't go and use hand sanitizer as soon as you've shaken the person's hand, but just you know, take people on the journey. You know, let them uh, let them see the precautions you're taking without it being too obvious. But you know, it's it's finding that natural approach to it. I think is so important. Yeah, and expanding on that point, Steve, in terms of allowing your customer or prospect to see that you are taking these things seriously, which we should be, but also if we take that one step further, um, no matter what client meeting I go into, negotiation or an existing contact, whoever it is, the things that I do at the start in terms of housekeeping, agreeing the agenda and what the outcomes are going to be, but what I'll also do, ensure I take notes, I make sure that the person who I'm with is aware that I'm taking notes because they get, like you, like all of us here, you've got 100% of my focus and attention. I've written, you know, I've got Sarah's name down here so I don't forget. Equally, what I'll do is I'll turn my phone off in the meeting. Uh, I don't have a smartwatch, particularly, not, not, not really my sort of thing, so that isn't likely to go off, but I'll let the customer see my phone is off. Unless it's in a negotiation and you're at the best and final offer stage where you need to phone the finance director or somebody else to get clarification, but the vast majority of times my phone gets turned off. It's those subtle little things that do make a difference and it's not being a gimmick either because you're actually minimizing your in your potential for disruptions while you're with that customer so there are only benefits I, to that yeah i think smart watch this is a great point and I, i've been in many meetings where somebody may not be clock watching but the fact they're looking at their watch to see what text messages just come through makes gives that impression that they are a, you know we might not intend it we may have habits that we just need to make make ourselves aware of and be aware of that of, you know not to be looking at our watch not to be clicking the pen those little things that other people will pick up on that you may not as, as the person, you know, as the uh, person representing the organization. So be aware. And if, if it needs be, you know, practice the process first. But I mean, you may well come on to that, Adam, you know, with, with any on housekeeping. Sorry. <laughs> I know. It's, crack on. <laughs> this is what we do. This is good. That's why there's a kind of loose agenda. I and mean, we could talk about yeah, that yeah. around all sorts, which is great. That's the value, I think, of, of everybody in business, not just the purpose of this webinar, but to reach out to people and form those partnerships because I see this sound really cheesy and cliche, but there is strength in collaboration. Um, yeah. you know, extra skills that, that, that you can bring in. Yeah. So Steve, you were about to say something or were you not? No, I, I was going to mention PowerPoint because you had it on the screen there and it's just a, a, a thought of my, a BFO, blinding flash of the obvious. Again, it's not housekeeping necessarily, but I, I have been in many sales meetings in the past or presentations where, there's nothing worse than somebody reading off the screen. You know, we talk about kinesthetic audio, audio or visual learners, you know, but please make sure, you may be covering this later, Adam, but please make sure you don't just read word for word what's on the screen. They want to see you and know you've got credibility in terms of what you do and what your product is all about. Um, you know, some of the best sales meetings I've been into actually have been where somebody's actually brought something to help demonstrate the product. Um, but anyway, I'll let you carry on, Adam, because you may well be covering that. That's a really, really fair point. And you've mentioned it, so we'll do it now. You're absolutely right in that your PowerPoint deck, it's a tool. People should be focused on you as the presenter. You know, you're there to add value to them, feature advantages, benefits, all those sorts of things. They shouldn't be focused on reading a slide, let alone we shouldn't be reading the slide to them. Otherwise, what's the point in you being there? Um, and perhaps how I word things sometimes can come across a little bit direct, but it's about being direct with ourselves. So then when we do speak to our prospects or customers, we're, we're in a very strong position. So you're right, Steve, mm -hmm. PowerPoint is a tool. It isn't a script. That's not how we should be using it. Um, so yeah, fair shout. Back, back to your agenda, Adam, back to your agenda. <laughs> it's all good. All, all good. <laughs> so really, when we think about presenting, it's really investing that time into, and I've called it there, the grind, because that's exactly what it is working through your prep make sure you're on point it goes without saying that we should be tailoring what we're presenting if there isn't a brief it's good to perhaps ask for one the reason it's important to ask for a brief is because the person you're seeing then knows what to expect um, they're going to have a bit more of a connection and anticipation of what you're there to talk about as sales sometimes sales people will spend so much time talking about themselves and our businesses, either through nerves or sheer passion, there's nothing wrong with that. But in reality, we should be in that consultative selling mode, which is questioning, where we should be only speaking for 20% of the time, using fact finding, probing questions, clarifying questions, those sorts of things to really get to where the value is. Um, 
some of the pre-game stuff again work on your timings make sure they're absolutely spot on if you've got 45 minutes ensure you deliver it within the 45 minutes if you need to bring a team with you make sure you're bringing the right team make you sure that someone who you do bring along is actually quite presentable worthy so you can have someone who's a subject matter expert but they may not present that well it's a it's a tough call to make internally but only take the a team with you if you're going to pitch and present uh, printouts i've already mentioned that if you're on zoom be mindful of you know, what's behind you uh, steve uh, he's always been rocking a virtual background that looks really good so you know <laughs> let's make sure uh, it hides a mess in the, in the office adam i have to say <laughs> so invest time in your in your pre-game so then we get on to, I guess, some, some of the meat there, um, which is where, you know, how, how is it that we're going to open up our presentations when we're there? Um, the first one, again, bold letters there, is breathe. This is something that I still do when I'm giving a keynote or a presentation, whatever. I'll always put a note at, at the top of my slide deck that I've always had printed out that says breathe. Because in the throes of that conversation, you can end up, running short of breath because you're talking so quickly, just breathing slows everything down and it gives your brain the oxygen it needs to then identify the wider picture. What's the stuff that's not being said with the people that you're presenting to? So breathe, slow things down a bit. And then we have the alternatives, the, the conventional and the shock type of openings where you can start a presentation off saying, good morning, this is what we're going to talk about. And then into the first slide. There's nothing wrong with that. That's very much conventional. Whereas an alternative type of open would be, for example, um, hi, Steve, it's nice to meet you. By the end of our time together, these are the outcomes that you can expect. This is what we're expecting in return. So good morning. Let me talk you through our presentation. So what you're doing is you're selling them the end of the presentation. You're starting at the end and then going into your presentation. Um, Reminds me of uh, when I was at uh, university, I think it was, and I was always told, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them. And then tell them what you told them. You know? <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> um, I, I don't know, just before we go too far on this slide, a question from Sundeep, just going back to saying about getting a brief, Adam. Yep. She says she struggles She struggles always to get the brief from the client uh, or, or from the prospect. Any tips on that, that bit specifically on getting the brief? Absolutely. Getting a brief or an insight, Sundeep, is, is really important because it's showing potential for buying signals and buying intent. If they're going to ask questions or give you potentials for a solution it's important we do try and get those so you're right to at least try and get them because it's, it's part of the sales prospect qualification process are these people ready mm. to work with you yet but if that isn't openly available to you well there's a reason they want to talk to you in the first place so what do you think the value is and then construct it that way that's the only real suggestion that I would offer really is you offer value in some way and bearing in mind that value needs to be making life easier, productivity or saving money. Those tend to be the top three, of course, quality, but then again, people pay you for a fair price for a good quality product anyway. So if there isn't a brief, try and create one that's based around them. Don't have two slides opening up about, about our business, our journey. If somebody hasn't asked for that, you can touch on it, but just get straight into the value. And if anything, if there is no agenda or brief, go straight into questions, if you can, to maximise that time. So that's how if, I would respond. I completely agree. And if they want to know a bit more about you and your business, if there's an opportunity for them to ask that question at the end. And that's the easy part for any one of us to talk about our own business and about us. But yeah, I completely agree. Get into the meat, you know, get, get straight stuck in. Absolutely. And, and again, it's not being afraid or shy just to ask for that brief, you know, what is it you'd like to get out of our time together? We can cover a lot. What are, the, what are the points that really matter to you to maximize our time? It's how we're asking for those. We don't just have to say, hey, what's the brief? Or, you know, have you got an idea of an agenda? It, it probably pushing and saying that a little bit more, perhaps. Uh, great question. Perfect, thank um, you. Hopefully, Sandeep, that was uh, helpful to you. Yeah, if it's not, call it out and we'll, we'll go through it again. Uh, it's really important. We've all made time for this. So let's just drive that value. Love that. Mm. Um, so the journey, eye contact, gestures, equally important. Invite questions or not uh, tends to be a good uh, sticking point there in terms of you've got a set time of 45 yeah. minutes. Do we invite questions while we're presenting or save them to the end? Um, 
that's always a danger zone i find and from personal experience adam if i invite questions it can almost derail the whole presentation um if you're not careful yeah so if you do invite questions i guess is it about knowing how to handle the response to those whether which ones to park and which ones to respond to straight away yeah so traditionally how i would approach that as part of the agenda setting while i'm in the meeting at the right at the front summarizing everything including outcomes depending on the context and if it's a fixed time of 45 minutes say look, i'd love to invite questions but i'm respectful of your time i don't want us to unnecessarily overrun so if you save your questions for the end i'll address them one by one until you know we do need to finish the meeting so it's kind of set that expectation more often than not that's normally what i would do if i'm on a time restriction because the question could be quite an emotive question about delivery and by the time you've you've covered off the question about delivery you've only got five minutes to talk about the value proposition and and commercials in which case what is that person when you've left what is it they're going to remember you for so I would normally invite questions at the end, but position it really carefully. If people still want to ask questions, um, make sure they're aware of the implication or the cost of that, and or make a note of each of those questions as they're asked at the time, in case your prospect forgets when it gets to the end. Um, that's why it's good to have a team with you when you are presenting. So you've got a wing person with you who can write down these questions and, and who's asked those questions. Perfect, so, thank you, Adam. It's good, good insight, good insight. No problem. Be aware of who's in the room. Responsibilities. Are we presenting to a team of to decision makers or influencers or, or champions? You know, each of these people have different responsibilities. Let's make sure that we are hitting the point of each one of those people. Exactly the same. I, I'm conscious there's a lot of B2B type stuff here, um, but these do translate into B2C as well. So if you have a couple that are coming in, Arguably, there may not be one senior decision makers in a purchaser, but you need to take them equally as seriously and address each of those points. So it's just being aware of who it is that we're presenting to, whatever that solution is. And as Steve, you rightly mentioned, it's also about making sure the point's landed, perhaps asking a follow up question. Um, but we're perhaps not here today to look at objection handling, but it's good to invite the objection. So, you know, if the point's landed, so we've gone through the commercial proposition, have you got any questions about that or any concerns around that, Steve, that you and I can address now? You just get it out there, check the point's landed and invite the question. Um, and, again, and a couple of points. Up. Well, one, one point for me, and I've got a, a comment from James. So when you ask that question, is there anything, you know, then leave the silence. Use silence as part of that process. Don't sort of jump in straight away with the answer to your own question. But James has just um, added a comment in the box about in terms of who's in the room with responsibilities, is it not, should we not be checking that the decision maker is in the room before we even get to the meeting? Yeah, I love because that. Because a meeting without a decision maker is no point in having it at all, he's sort of saying. Yeah, it's a really fair point. This is where we look at sales qualification, where we just ask, who's going to be in the meeting? What key things would you like me to talk about? And you'll start to qualify that person. Just because also the, the DM isn't there may not matter depending on the structure of the bid or the presentation because it's actually the influencer that's going to be more valuable to you because they've got the ear of the decision maker, director, whoever that needs to be. Yeah. But we do need to establish that up front. And that's why putting in the work, first of all, about agreeing an agenda what are the key takeaways that they'd like to see? How can we help you with the next steps in terms of mobilization? We ask those sorts of questions and we're going to start qualifying the opportunity and, 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 and those people. But we do also need to be aware, depending on the size, that it's also valuable to talk to influencers and, and champions as well. It's a really fair point. Uh, and you definitely need to know that going in because then you can yeah. start accordingly. Um, pick up something else you said, Steve, uh, around questioning. And in particular around the forms of communication. So the final point on, on the slide there talks about pace, pitch, uh, volume, tone, accentuation. These are really important communication techniques that we need to be mindful of. You know, we're here today and it's quite fast paced because we've got an hour and there's a lot to cover and it's good fun and we're still making time for questions. This is great. But in sales presentation, I'd be much more heightened to how quickly I'm speaking, the pitch, the tone. And picking up on the point you said, Steve, around silence, that is a really important part of communication. Um, being And moreover, being comfortable with silence. Let the person take stock of what you've said. 
Um, and then that links into questioning, where some of the common mistakes around consultative questioning can be right. You're right, Steve, answering your own question when we're not giving a prospect time to formulate a response. I've seen that before. Um, also, stacking of questions tends to be something else that I, I see from time to time. You'll see it a lot when there's news interviews with politicians and whoever else. But sometimes people will stack questions. So I can say to you, Steve, oh, Steve, good to see you. How's your weekend? How's family? How's that last deal that you worked on? And it's too many questions. Keep your questions simple, concise, to the point. The reason sometimes people will stack questions is actually they're a bit afraid, potentially, of the response to the real question because it could lead to an objection. It could lead to a technical question where you're going to get tested on your product or service knowledge. So normally it's the first question that we ask and then stack it to soften that a little bit. But in reality, mm -hmm. let's keep them single. Let's not stack them. Be comfortable with the silence and follow to a natural conclusion. Um, really rather important. Um, and also really remembering that it, it, it's a conversation to be inquisitive. Even though there's a brief, it's asking those types of questions just to get to, again, to, to where that value is. So housekeeping, pre-game, um, the openings, uh, rather important. I'm just going to click back for a sec. Um, there, this, I wanted to cover this off and I just totally missed it, um, is around gold, silver, bronze objective planning. Um, when we go into that negotiation or, or a presentation, we shouldn't just turn up with a brief and fingers crossed we get the deal. We should go in with the resilience of we're ready, whatever the outcome is. So your gold objective could be it's an agreement in principle, it's a deal, maybe it's a straight transaction there and then, which is great. But if that's taken away from you, how quickly can you adapt? Sales is about having that adaptability and that resilience. Mm -hmm. So if that's gone off the table, how can you retain control rather than just taking the loss? So you need a silver objective. That objective could be to then look at booking a future meeting. Maybe your goal is to get the deal, but the whole decision maker structure within the business has changed. So it's off the table at the moment. Right. Regain control. I could appreciate things have moved on at the moment in the business. Is there anybody else that you'd like me to present to? And when would you like that to keep this thing moving forward? And then perhaps the bronze could be a deferral for six months, but then you check in um, after three months. So I also wanted to highlight that. Whilst you've got your, it's about being back at school, isn't it? With my stars, my gold stars, my silver stars, my bronze. But um, <laughs> Sarah's just asking a point, uh, asking a question. What do you think about red lines? setting red lines in a sales meeting and i think i think from that what she's getting at is you know at what point do you walk away what is your red line in the sand yeah i love or that red line or line in the sand yeah <laughs> so this is almost if you, if you give me a bit of leeway here looking at negotiation skills and strategies so you agree your objection your objectives gold silver bronze as part of that consideration if it's a negotiation you do have the best that kind of red line where you are prepared to walk away and so if you're having that conversation one of the most important words and i think it was uh chris voss i think he wrote a book called never split the difference um he calls it labeling uh where you label that potential challenge um so he also mentions a really important word which is called fairness business about being fair we don't want to just get negotiated to our lowest price because then where's that respect? So if there are red lines, it's of being clear of what they are before we go in. And do you know what? It's OK to walk away. There's real power in that. Uh, we want a healthy business, healthy margins, healthy team, healthy structure so we can scale. Um, it doesn't help the bottom line. Principles don't help the bottom line. But you want people. You want the right book of work. You want to attract the right people. And going into that meeting, um, you have um, like it's, it's called a ZOMA, Z-O-M-A, which is zone of mutual agreement. You should already have that agreed before you go in. So you know where that line sits and then just being totally straight. I'm, I'm sorry, but I, mean, I guess it, you, what, you're, what you're saying, Adam, is quite right, is, you know, if you're in the negotiation phase, it's very different from going into the sales and we're really focusing on the sales phase today. But the good news is if you're in negotiation, there is a keenness for somebody to buy from you. It's just find that finding that, as you say, zone of mutual agreement between you. But that, there's almost, I guess, we could do a whole new lunch and learn, a whole different lunch and learn, just on that, the art of negotiation. Yes. Um, so, Sarah, what I'd say is if you want to have a conversation about that, you know, please do reach out to Adam 
um, or ourselves, but Adam, Adam is a sales expert and I'm sure can give you more advice on, on that negotiation part of the sales process. Yeah, no, no problem. Uh, solid question, Sarah. Let's keep them coming. By the way, if anybody wants to do a casual one-to-one afterwards to fill in any gap, just let me know. I'm here to add value. We are a business community trading okay. through some quite exciting times. Um, so yeah, that, that covers that part off. Uh, then sort of final bit really, I don't know how we're doing for time, Steve. I know you'll just pull the plug if we're going on too long, so... <laughs> no, no, we've got about 15 minutes, about 15 okay. minutes. Okay, so I'll just play through some of these in terms of quick wins that we can introduce into our um, presentations. First of all, the big green tick uh, is, is a good thing as well. Uh, green we represents green tick, Adam. We do. Green represents good, and a tick means good too. So if you are presenting something that's particularly around maybe commercials or the solution you're offering, using green ticks just subconsciously uh, suggests that this is good. Um, use avoid jargon but use appropriate terms where you can don't assume people know so i could have dropped the term zoma for example assuming everybody knows what zoma is that's not always the case so i explained what it was um good slide to finish with um is a commitment slide as opposed to always questions or thank you something like that particularly in a sales presentation is to use a commitment slide so on the left hand side of the slide i'll have all of my commitments to you, Steve. You're a fantastic prospect, a really good guy. I think we can add value together. These are our commitments to you. But then on the same slide, but on the right-hand side, I'll then have the commitments that I expect from the customer. Again, this is about mutual respect. So those commitments from the customer could be payment on time, attendance to monthly meetings, X number of quantities, those sorts of things. Let's get absolutely everyone's clear on where we stand straight out of the gate. So commitment slide sets that stall out and then you can go into the next stage, which would then of course be closing. Um, I, I love that because it also eliminates the opportunity for quibbling or negotiation later on down the track, doesn't it? You know, and I often talk to my clients, you know, particularly in, in the manufacturing or delivering a, a particular service, you know, agree up front what it exactly is you're going to be delivering or providing for your client. Yeah, totally. And if you're taking uh, a product that perhaps represents lowish value in terms of, you know, for you, you wouldn't take a whole photocopy, for example, to then leave that behind, but leave samples where you can. Uh, we've lent a little bit on um, visual kinesthetic and auditory styles of learning. It's also a great buying signal when somebody, say this pen that I've got here, just keeps handling the pen and, and they're clicking the top and they're playing with it, brilliant. Leave them with that. So it's, you know, where you can leave samples, you know, it, it, it is quite good to do that. But then don't go too far with it. Um, I guess what qualifies me as a sales trainer and coach, it's not always about all the successes and things that have gone well. It's actually a huge catalogue of things that I've done wrong that I've learned from. You know, it's sharing those insights is where sometimes that value sits. And by way of example, we were pitching to, um, I know you said the name then, but we were pitching to a key account. This is before I was running a sales training business. And we used iPads for the presentation handouts. It's a high-end global contract. And we left the iPads with the, with, with the client because they, you know, it was that kind of big deal. And they scored us down so heavily for that because they were then thinking, well, hang on a minute, that's, you know, bribery, anti-bribery, corruption, you're all buying us iPads, so, you know, you're, you know, hopefully we're going to like you more, so just be careful about what you do leave, and whatever it is you do leave, much like with your laptops, is your setup's got to be on point, quick, punchy, get to it, and so has your exit from the building. As soon as you're done, just get it all, shove it in your bag and get out of there because they're going to want to have a debrief, talk between themselves. And of course, there could be somebody else coming in to present immediately after you as well. So be prepared for a quick setup and of course, a quick put away as well. Um, and then finally, probably just before that is around the, um, we mentioned commitment slide, but don't be afraid to close it in some form. We need to retain control throughout one of the phrases I mentioned to Steve ages ago was ABC. What's that stand for, Steve? Always be closing, Ed. Always be closing. <laughs> exactly. And it's not pressure closes and gimmicks like, oh, 20% off just for this month for you. And none of that business. If there's a deal to it's be to done, be avoided with the always be complimenting, Ed. I think that one doesn't go down so well. <laughs> no, no, no <laughs> not, not quite. But it's take, you know, regain and keep control of that conversation. Yeah, yeah. 
next steps. Uh, another quick uh, quick question from Sunday. She's just saying, at what point do you agree next steps? If you can't close, yep. how would you agree next steps? What's your advice on that? If you can't close, it's the same thing in my head. Uh, closing and agreeing next steps. As I said before, it's a good question, but it is about keeping that control. So it is different ways of looking at it. You could say, when would you like, you know, what, what would you prefer in terms of next steps, the next meeting? Mm -hmm. Or I quite prefer mm -hmm. proposing what those next steps are in terms of, so we can agree, it's called a summary close. So we can agree that we can solve these points for you. The next steps would be for us to get you set up on our system. A contract will be out at the end of next week. Are you comfortable to proceed? It's those sorts what, what, of what, she, She's just put another comment and she said, before the quick exit exclamation mark, I think what she's saying is if you haven't managed to close the deal, at what point do you agree next steps before walking out the room? <laughs> oh, right. Okay. Got you. It, again, in my head, it, it all fits at the same time. Even let's just say, for example, that we finished the meeting or it's already happened. Actually, we attended a meeting last week. You haven't been on this webinar by that point and you've left it with, we look forward to hearing from you soon, which is a very civilized and polite thing to do, but that's not a close. So even though you've missed that opportunity, there's nothing wrong with going back now via email in particular, sharing insight. It was great to spend time with you last week. It was interesting to learn dot, 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 dot. I hope you found our meeting of you know, mutually, mutually beneficial. What, how, you know, how would you like to proceed in terms of next steps? Failing that, I'll give you a call or I'll drop you. I'll make contact again next Thursday morning, unless you prefer an alternative time. It's subtle, but it's always trying to keep that control. I think you, you're always inviting more questions in what you're saying, Adam. Sarah is just saying, how quickly and how regularly would you follow up a sales meeting? I love that. If it can't be agreed there and then within the week, again, context specific, but within a week, if they're not thinking about you, then there's, there's, there's a problem there. So within a week, and then could be the follow-up question of what if they don't respond, which, has, which can happen. So in that case, we leave it for another week and we get in contact again. What we tend to do, I would recommend, is you mix it up. We use LinkedIn or we'll phone. There's an email, those sorts of things. And if it gets to the point where actually there's now zero communication, this is where it comes from the muscle and the confidence to then email there's a number of five different steps, five different things you could do. But one of them is I can understand, you know, it's great to have our conversation historically. We can understand where there's mutual value. I think I'm, you know, we're clear on how I can help you. Perhaps now isn't quite the right time. So we'll leave you to it or we'll, you know, we'll, we'll leave you guys alone. Let us know when you're ready again. What you're doing there is you're taking the deal, everything off the table. The prospect in prospect shoes always wants to feel loved and wanted. Frankly, you've got better things to do with your time, Sarah. It's try and try. And if they're not biting, be prepared to walk away. In reality, you still keep control because in two months, maybe three months, you get in contact again. How are things going? Moreover, you find an angle. You message the person on email or use a video on LinkedIn or whatever it is. So I've just seen this about your business and you just popped into my mind. How are things? Are you ready to look at this again? Or how can I help you with this again? Or those kind of things, but it's having a confidence just to frankly walk away. And that's where the value of a healthy pipeline sits and your sales strategy and your sales processes. So, yeah, I'm going to put a bit of a tangent. I there. completely agree with what you're saying. Adam. In fact, thinking of my own, you know, our own business here, Action Coach, some of our most successful clients we've worked with over the years have taken more than, you know, more than the average time to, to actually decide that coaching is right for them. And, and sometimes you have just to walk away, but keep in contact, keep that, those touch points regular and you know that that opportunity will re reappear it'll it'll come back um so it's, it's learning about how to, how pushy to be i guess and how when to walk away and come back later absolutely in the meantime like things that they put on linkedin mm -hmm. comment on things show yeah, interest yeah. No, we're not, don't let the way, fire go out exactly exactly right and we're not selling arguably i suppose you could call it selling but it's yeah, influencing yeah. it's a bit different we're not looking to close on those posts or whatever else yeah. but just touch points it keeps you match fit on what's going on in their business as well um well, which that's the phrase, put, it, put it on the back burner i guess that's partly where, where that phrase comes from I, I guess you know put it on the back burner keep the flame ticking over low but don't don't let it go out absolutely i love that analogy yeah that's spot on yeah yeah 
Brilliant. Well, I'm conscious uh, we've been 50 minutes and it doesn't feel like, it never feels like it's 50 minutes with you, Ad, because it just flows so well. And so many great conversations. Thank you, James. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Sandeep. I've been, I'm looking to one side because like Adam was saying, I've been writing the questions down and writing your name. So thank you to those of you who've submitted questions this lunchtime. Uh, Adam, just before you go, I know you're back uh, in about a month's time to talk a bit about your own journey and your own business and how you've got through the lockdown process and we're going to be putting out a poll to see what our listeners would like to like us to cover as well on that particular uh, occasion but before you go I want you to have the opportunity just to, to sell yourself uh, tell us a bit about what you do at Impact Sales Coaching and how you can support business owners right now who are coming out of lockdown or sort of looking into that next phase as we warm up and how you can provide support and advice and guidance no over to you okay thank you first step your strategy. Have you got a sales strategy? Do you know what your routes to market are? Do you know what your value proposition is? Have you got a USP or a point of differentiation? Do you know the difference between a USP and a point of differentiation? How articulately are you communicating those messages? Are you prepared and comfortable with how to open a sales conversation, introductions, either phone, email, or face-to-face? -face? Then think about the objections. Do you have a process to handle objections? Do you know how to handle those? And then, as we said before, around negotiating, presenting, and also the various different forms of closing. So those are the mechanics of sales that I can help you with. Equally, I can help you with the sales performance mindset, the resilience, the confidence, the motivation as well. But I solely like to double down on the fundamentals, the building blocks of sales. And we look at time management, those sorts of things as well. But if you want to close more sales and you fancy really chilled i'm not here to close everybody if you fancy just that conversation because we are a closed business community grab a one-to-one -one with me see if i can add some value to you brilliant well, well thank you so much for that adam and you know i we, we've worked together for uh, well almost throughout the whole of lockdown last year you know joint webinars joint workshops and i can't highly recommend adam enough to you know in terms of sales specific support if you're struggling in that area of your business you know, really do recommend a conversation with Adam. Likewise, if you're a business owner who is struggling with other parts of your business, whether it's your you know, basics, your finance or perhaps um, business planning strategy, um, or it is your time management. Adam's mentioned a bit about time management in terms of sales or whether it's, um, you know, how you communicate with your team and build your team. We would love to have a conversation with you here at Action Coach. We're offering a couple of things um, over the next few weeks. So we're offering free coaching sessions to anybody who contacts us. We'll give you a free 45-minute coaching session. We've also got our Six Steps Business Health Check, which we're doing uh, once a week. If you want to join us for one of those, again, free of charge to you as a business owner, where we go through our um, tried and tested over 35 years six steps process looking at every aspect of your business and giving examples and ideas of how you can improve your business we're also doing these lunch and learns which uh, we've got adam with us today on wednesday we've got rachel mcgillian fee who's going to be looking all about uh, instagram and facebook and how you can use those tools to build your business to increase your marketing because before we get to the sales process we need prospects in that funnel and how do we do that? Well, we need to have a marketing plan and a marketing strategy in place. So uh, Rachel is going to help talk to us about social media, in particular Instagram and Facebook on Wednesday. Um, and also we have our 30X programme. We've been running that. We introduced it as a new programme throughout lockdown. It's been hugely popular. It's 30 mini workshops, uh, video based, which you do in your own time. Uh, you then have a 90 day planning workshop, an accountability coaching session every single week with myself, one of my colleagues. And that is £30 a week, including VAT, and there's no contract. So it's a great way to dip your toe in the water and just see if coaching is for you and to see if the content is something you can apply in your own business. And I have to say, every everybody who starts that program absolutely thoroughly enjoys it. And uh, we enjoy catching up once a week to see how much they're learning and putting into practice from that from that workshop so if you'd like if any of that intrigues you please do get in touch as adam has said you know we're both on facebook we're both on linkedin you know do visit both of our websites connect with us if you're listening on either of those flat platforms this lunchtime uh please do connect with us afterwards we'd love to have that conversation and uh, and share and hear from you as well hear about your business hear about your ideas and share some some experiences of ours over the last 12 months which i'm really pleased to say adam himself will be doing in more detail on the 14th of April. So we can't wait. I'm going to have to go and get a different type next time. Madam, you talked about making sure we're dressed appropriately for the audience. I hope I've done that this lunchtime. And uh, so you're the only only guest uh, we've had on this, uh, this uh, lunch and learn. They've actually got me to wear my tie since we've been out of the office. But anyway, it's great to have you here and, and uh, I'm glad you're doing well. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for giving up your lunchtime this Monday. And uh, thank you again to those listeners who've asked questions. Adam, do you want to say anything before I finish? 
Uh, it's been really nice to spend time with everybody uh, for Lunch and Learn. It's always good. Steve, you're rocking a shirt jumper combo with a tie. You've gone all out. <laughs> You've hit the mark spot on. It's been good fun, as always. Thank you for the invitation uh, as well. Next time we'll have to talk colour of ties, Adam. I've got a whole collection upstairs. But anyway, we'll leave that for the, for the listener to guess. And uh, we will uh, look forward to seeing you on Wednesday with Rachel talking all social media. But for now, have a great lunch. Uh, stay well, stay safe, and we will see you very, very soon. Take care, everybody, and thanks again to Adam.